the Lord together. Amen. We have much to be thankful for. We have much to praise him for this morning because he's faithful. Amen. Now, that's not my message today, but that's how we got started this morning. There's a bunch of world travelers around among us. Great to have the Turners back with us from the Philippines. Having spent it all summer there and seeing what the Lord would have them to do. It's great to have the Beals with us today. And uh, they're back on furlough and, and from Thailand. And even Rusty Ewan back from Israel. Man, it's great to have you home, Rusty. Praise the Lord for it. And I love uh, uh, hearing what God is doing around the world. I'm looking forward to getting some of those, some, well, all of those men up here soon in the near future and talking about their trips and what God is, uh, is doing around the world. Praise the Lord. Now, James chapter 3 is where we're at today. James chapter 3. And uh, Brother Jones, you can go ahead and get that for me if you don't mind. James chapter 3. Now, Bible students, as we study the Word of God and as we uh, read it and study it, we know that when we come to chapter 3 in of James, that it's going to deal with one main topic. There are those chapters in the Word of God that way. There are... Uh, uh, the Genesis 3, we know that God deals with the fall of man, the sin when sin entered the world. We know when we get to Hebrews chapter 11, we're dealing with the hall of faith chapter and the faith of God's people through the generations. And we know when we get to Revelation 21, whoo, we're talking about that new Jerusalem descending out of the, the heaven from the Lord to rest upon that new earth that he's created for us. And I like reading that chapter. Going into chapter 22, talking about the streets of gold and those jasper walls and that throne of God, that river of, that river of life that comes out of that. Praise God for it. Amen and amen. But we get to James 3. We get to James chapter 3. It's dealing with the topic of our tongue. Of our tongue. Another word for that, another vernacular if we want to say it that way, is the way we use our mouths. The words that we use. The speech that we give. The title of my message today is a trained tool or a powerful poison. A trained tool or a powerful poison. The text uses the word tongue, and it, and it describes the power of it, how such a small little member of our bodies can create such fire in our world. It uses that terminology in this chapter. It's no wonder that David said in Psalm 39, he said, I will, ta I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. He goes on later in Psalm 141 to say, Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Job, described by God as a, a man that was perfect and upright. God said he, he uh, escheweth evil. Goes away from it. He voids it. Runs from it. And yet Job described him as, as when he was answering God. He said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay my hand upon my mouth. I've heard some pretty eloquent preachers. Some, some waxing eloquent kind of a preachers in my, in my time of listening. I, we heard one a couple weeks ago, didn't we, man? Uh, Johnny Pope deliver a powerful message. I'm telling you what, if you don't like long preaching, you wouldn't have liked it. But I'm telling you, I liked it. And he was fe God was feeding me through it. I'm telling you, I feel like it was a three-hour message, but it was good. I mean, it was good. It didn't feel like three hours, did it? It felt like five minutes, but it was long. But anyways, he was waxing eloquent to teach us the Word of God and to preach the power of that uh, Scripture that God was bringing out. But I've also heard the mouth be used for great hurt. And before we start bringing other people up to mind, before we start pointing the finger, 
Let us raise the hand and say, I am guilty before God. I am guilty before God of using my mouth inappropriately and to cause hurt. The key, folks, please don't miss this. The key to solving most of the problems in this church are found right here in this chapter. I'm going to say that again. The key to solving most of the problems found in Shenandoah and in modern churches today is right here in James chapter 3. Is my mouth, is your mouth, your tongue a trained tool for His glory and, and for His use? Or is it a powerful poison that the devil wants to use to set on fire the world before us. Let's look at the scripture, please, today. James chapter 3. Let's start in verse 1, please, if you would. Again, this chapter is very, very clear. But let's allow God to bring it out for us today. Uh, James chapter 3, verse 1. The Bible says, My brethren... He's speaking to Christians here. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. The word for masters here in the Greek is didaskalos. It sounds like didaskalot, but it's didaskalos. And it means teacher or instructor. That's what it means here. And so some people believe it's, it, it to say, don't have a lot of teachers. I don't believe that's what it says. I, I know the Word of God says, the multitude of counselors, there is safety. I, my King James says, be not many masters. In other words, don't try to give teaching everybody and lecturing everybody about what you think is best and about what you have the answer for. It seems like, folks, it seems like in our day that we know everything and we've got to lecture every single person on our opinion and why we this is right. Where in the Bible do you find the liberty to do that? Not one place. It's okay to have an opinion. I'm an American. And I'm a Christian. And I have great liberty in both places. It's okay to have an opinion. But God never gave me the freedom to give everybody else my opinion. Amen. Come on now, we're all guilty. It's okay, you're guilty, I'm guilty. We can say amen because we know the truth. Amen, we, can, we know the truth. Look at verse 2. For in many things we offend all. That's, in other words, we're, we all offend people when we speak. We're all guilty of it. We all have mouths and we're all sinners. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us and we turn about their whole body. A horse is a very powerful animal, is it not? It's amazing. Now, God gave us dominion over all the earth. Did He not? He gave man dominion over all the earth. We are able to tame lots of different animals. And and think about a man and how puny a man is against a big muscle of an animal like a horse. And yet we can mount it and we can put a little bit in its mouth and we can control it and steer it and master it because of a little bit in its mouth. Think about that. He's, he's given us here illustrations to, to understand our tongues. Puts a little bit in the mouth and it can be steered. A horse controlled by a bit can render great service, but can, uncontrolled can render such harm. I've not spent a long time around horses, a little bit, but there are some in here that have had much more time around horses, and you could probably tell us the stories of an uncontrolled horse or one trying to get tamed. I spent, spent a little bit of time in Shinkatig, Virginia this, uh, this summer, and uh, over there they have that pony swim where the firemen uh, gather up the, the, the wild ponies over there on Assateague Island and swim them across to Shinkatig, and they auction them off, and people go, and they, and they buy these, these horses so that they can break them and teach them and train them to be for their use. Wonderful that the fire department is able to use that means to raise money for the, for the department throughout the whole year. And I think about that training and teaching horses. 
and how God has allowed us just with a little bit to accomplish some of that. Look at the next uh, example here in verse 4. The Bible says, Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Think about that. A small little rudder on a massive ship. And yet this ship, think about uh, modern day uh, military vessels. Brother Dyson, we're modern day military vessels. And this massive ship is ready to go to war and is a trained tool and all these thousands of men that are ready and, and women as well ready to, uh, to go uh, into notice. And yet that whole ship is controlled by this rudder in the back. Right? Think about some of this. Think about what God is describing here. A ship that has got a rudder and a well-trained captain to use it can be a powerful tool, can be a well-trained tool. But one that is uncontrolled could be a powerful poison for those aboard, for others even. I remember a ship called the Bismarck. The Bismarck, World War II, okay, German battleship. It was one of the biggest and most powerful battleships that ever came out of Europe, the Bismarck. This ship was, was magnificent. It was big. It was powerful. In fact, uh, it, what happened was uh, uh, they, they unle- unleashed it into the Atlantic, and it began to attack Allied vessels that were taking supplies to Great Britain. And uh, they were trying to cut off the supply lines going to Britain. And that's how Britain was staying alive at that time. And so what, what Great Britain did is they, they sent two ships to go hunt it down. Two ships to go hunt it down. And one was sunk and the other one was so badly uh, uh, damaged that it limped back home. This Bismarck was nothing to be, uh, was, was, a, was a major vessel, was not to be messed around with. And so uh, what happened was uh, Britain said, we got to take care of this. we got, we got to do something about this. And they, and they got together many, many vessels, many ships, including one aircraft carrier. And I wrote it down. The name of it was the HMS Ark Royal. And upon this aircraft carrier were 15 um, torpedo-carrying planes here, uh, torpedo bombers, if you would. And, uh, and so... Uh, in this course of this, of this struggle, and all these ships, but this one aircraft carrier, one of those torpedo bombers was able to damage the, uh, the, the linkage or the gears of the rudder of this ship. If I've got my history correct with that. And so this powerful battleship was, was still functioning, but it was crippled in the fact that the, that the rudder was stuck in a position and it could not be controlled. And so uh, they were not far from France, uh, occupied France at that time, and they were, they were going to head back that way and, and head that way to get, get some repairs on it. But instead of going straight to it, what, that, what happened was, because of the rudder, they began to do a massive circle. And so Great Britain sent out two battleships and two cruisers after it. And that whole big massive ship was brought down to nothing because of the rudder, because of the the steering capability on the back of it was damaged. A great vessel, a trained tool could inflict so much damage and yet it was brought down because of that little thing. Here's the description that God has given us when He's teaching us about our tongue. It's teaching us about our tongue. We go back, look at verse 5. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Exclamation point. You see that in the scripture? Exclamation point. He's pretty fired up when he's talking about it. Look, notice the word matter in this verse. Behold, how a great a matter a little fire kindleth. That's not matter as in a situation. That's not, uh, well, what's the matter situation there? But it's matter, Brother Horton, is science class kind of matter, 
Okay? And uh, I, I'm not as studious as you. I had to write down the definition. I had to make sure I got it right. In science class, it's a physical, physical substance to which any object consists. Of the states of matter, right? Solid, solid, liquid, gas. Okay, that's the type of matter that is being defined here that he's using. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And when you look that word up in the Greek, it is focused and pointing towards a great forest. Now think about that. We're talking about fire. And how great a matter. A forest made up of multitudes of trees full of fuel ready for that fire. How little a match, a little spark, a little flicker coming off some ash, a coal still coming off a fire can light a whole forest on fire. Brother Rubio, those forest fires over in California and all that, I don't comprehend that. I don't understand all that. And you wonder, how do these things start? Usually pretty small. Pretty small. That's what God is using here to define our tongue. Look at verse 6, please. Verse 6. Well, before I go that far, the Holy Spirit directed me a little bit. Do you remember, do you remember the Chicago fire? Do you remember learning about the great Chicago fire? Uh, year 1871. Chicago at that time was not as big as it is now, but it was pretty big. And that great Chicago fire destroyed 125,000, uh, excuse me, excuse me. It left 125,000 people homeless. That's a lot of people. Left them homeless. In the fact of it, it burned, if I'm not mistaken here, three days. And, and in the process, it jumped the Chicago River to continue burning. In all, 17,500 buildings were lost in the Great Chicago Fire. And it started by one lantern being knocked over in the O'Leary, farm, the O'Leary family's barn. The report, the story that most of us hear is the fact that the cow knocked it over. And all of that, half of that great city burnt to the, to the ground. Now think about our church for a moment and use that illustration and how one person's tongue can ignite a fire that could blaze this whole auditorium, this whole sanctuary. Be cautious with your mouth. Let me, as a Christian, as a man who wants to please God, be cautious with my mouth. As David said, let me set a watch. As Job said, let me, let me put my hand over my mouth and think before I speak. So dangerous. So dangerous. I believe 2,000 and, uh, 2,112 acres or something like that was burned in that Chicago fire. One commentator said, words spoken destructfully, unwisely, or even carelessly can set ablaze our whole world as we know it. Another commentator said, one wrong whispered word may spoil a reputation, smear a character, and even destroy the usefulness of a life. Wow. How many, how many worldly entertainers their, their world has been changed because in the moment they said one thing that others didn't like. I read about it one here recently. If I was to mention, I, I don't, we don't need to go too far in the worldly scene, but if I was to bring up a name of Jack Black. Jack Black is uh, an entertainer, is an actor of modern day, and he's also a musician apparently. And uh, he's been traveling around the world and in Australia most recently with some kind of uh, comedy rock band or something. And I was reading about this and uh, they were in Australia and there was a band member, uh, a person in the band that was having a birthday party. And they wanted to give them a cake and have put candles on it and make it part of the show or something like that. And so they, they walk out with a cake 
And, uh, and I believe Jack Black, he says, uh, make a wish. And this man in the moment says, don't miss Trump next time. That was literally two, one or two days after the assassination attempt. Now, I, I don't care. It doesn't matter who we support and, and what side and what not and, and all of that. I'm, I'm glad, praise God, that God was involved in that day and saved his life. I'm thankful for that. But I would be thankful that he saved anybody's life, the president, uh, the vice president, whoever, because I don't believe in that kind of violence. Amen. But in the moment he spoke that, and within a couple of days, the whole tour was canceled, and Australia uh, uh, authorities were threatening to deport the band because of its stirring up violence. This is the world against the world. You understand what I'm saying here? This is not Christians in the world. This is not Christians with Christians. But this is the world against the world. And here they are. We can understand. Uh, and I remember from my past. I remember when one spoke out against uh, George W. Bush just after 9-11. And I remember a, a, a group or a band that quickly disappeared. Why? Because our fire, or excuse me, our tongue kindles great fire. And God's warning us about it here. It's a world of iniquity. Look at verse 6, please. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body. And set on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. That's pretty strong language. It defileth the whole body. Didn't Jesus say in Matthew 15, he said, not that which not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Now, what does it mean there, that last phrase? And it is set on fire of hell. What that means is the destructive power of your mouth, your tongue, it's satanic. The devil wants us in our flesh to react and to say some things and destroy lives and ruin our testimonies. And he works it. He makes it, it makes, he encourages that. He encourages that. Sin, think about how sin entered the world. It was a forked tongue that persuaded Eve. And that serpent, remember that? Adam, when he was confronted, what did he do? Immediately, brand new sinner. He blamed God for giving him his wife, and then he blamed his wife for giving him the fruit. And he's the one that took of it. The Bible says he wasn't deceived. He took of it because his wife had already eaten it. Then Eve, then Eve was, was asked about it. And she blamed the serpent for what she had done. I understand he was tempting her, but she chose to do it. Remember when their, their firstborn son came, the first recorded words in the scripture that he gives, that's written down in Genesis chapter 4, he lied. I know it's not. Am I my brother's keeper? Wow. Right off the bat. How many of you are just like me? And every, every single time, it seems like, when in your early years, you got in trouble. Even in my adult years, every time I've gotten into a pickle, it's because of my mouth. Yeah. Go ahead. Here's a witness up there. Amen. I'm having fun. Thanks, Joe. An ungodly man diggeth up evil, and in his lips there is as a burning fire. Your mouth, your tongue, your speech. Now, 
This is a surface issue. Think about it. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. We see the surface. That's where it all comes out. That's where we see, we take notice to how your heart is doing by what's coming out the mouth. That's the root issue, the heart. I want to grab an illustration. Thank you, Brother Jones, for putting that table out for me. Sorry if you you can't see it over there, man. If you have the ability to put it up there, it's a, it's a pot. It's a it's a jug, and that's you and me. That's our nature from birth. Old nature. That's our heart. Watch this now. It even even tastes good. We like the old nature. It's because that's who we are. We're attracted to it. We desire it. We feel it. It We yearn for it. We we get pulled in those directions. Just this last week, just uh, laughing with some Christians a little bit of just some things in the past and and what God saved us out of. And it's just amazing uh, the the draw that can be there still. Because that's our old nature. Sinful. Yeah, that's who you and I are. We're sinful. Now we get saved, but this old flesh is still sinful. I praise God for the day. When we get our glorified bodies in heaven, not only do we kick off the health and the, and the disease and, the, and, and dying and all of that, but we kick off the old nature Amen. where we don't have those daily things in our minds that are, that are that the devil's trying to put something in there or, or that get us off track or that get us down a road that's not appropriate or that's off color or that's, that's just flat out wrong for Christians. Amen. Our old nature. This is how you were born. This is your sin, your your line of sin that comes from your parents. Amen. We all have a mommy and a daddy who are sinners before us. The only sinless one was Jesus Christ, our Messiah, who was virgin born and didn't have a sin line of an earthly father. On purpose. God designed it that way. That's our nature. Recognize your nature. Ask God for forgiveness of that nature. When we get saved, think about it. Think about what the scripture says. We get a new new nature. We become a new creature in Christ. The old nature, carnally minded. I'm I'm reading some scripture out of Romans 8 here. To be carnally minded is death. That's why when you're born naturally without being saved, your old nature is it's death. It's what it is. That's why Jesus said, Be born again. You must be born again. You need the new nature. You got to be transformed. The image of Christ. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. When you say carnal, we're talking about not spiritual. We're talking about fleshly, of this world. Praise God for the new birth when we get saved. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Going from death unto life, the old nature unto the new nature in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. That doesn't mean we don't struggle when we're saved. 
since I've been your pastor here. I've apologized for saying things to people, sometimes publicly, sometimes privately. Why? Because this old mouth still got some work that needs to be done to it. If you're able to bridle the mouth, the tongue, it says you're going to be, you're going to be perfect and able to bridle the whole body. But every day, come on now, Lord, help me. Forgive me of my sin nature. Forgive me for what comes naturally to my tongue, to my mouth, to my mind that comes out my mouth. And help me to be more like you. Your mouth, your tongue, your speech. Just like God gives you a new song when you get saved. You know how the scripture says that? I think it's Psalm 40. God has given us a new song. Like our music changes when we get saved. So does our speaking. So does our mouths. So is the way that our, our conversation, that we carry ourselves, all of that. But our mouths should be different. So what do I do, preacher? Where do I go from here? I don't mean to disappoint you, but this is a two-part message. I believe in Sunday night church. I love Sunday night church. I love family time on Sunday nights. We sing a little bit more. We have a good time. And uh, God shows up and helps us. I'm encouraging you to be back 6 o'clock tonight. I like Sunday night church. This morning is step one. Tonight is step two. Step one, how do, how do I fix this thing right here? You must be born again. If you are not saved, you do not have the Spirit of God about you, and that means that you're relying only on your own strength and your own old nature and your own flesh, and you will never be victorious. But praise God when we get saved in that new nature. Woo! Come on now. We'd start dying to self. We start uh, being transformed by the inside. Come on now, Romans chapter uh, 12, when it talks about uh, 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 verse 2, where it talks about don't be conformed to this world, but be, be transformed. Come on now, from the inside, with the Holy Spirit of God inside. Whew. you got to get saved. That's step number one. You need to be a new creature if you're going to have victory over your mouth. You've got to. You've got to. Are you going to have a trained tool for his glory and his use, or are you just going to spew out poison? And you say, why are you saying poison? Because it's in the scripture, and we're going to get to that, to that tonight, where God describes our mouths as poison, it's spewing out poison. Can you imagine? So I know some of y'all are weird, and you like to like, have snakes and spiders as pets. I know you're weird. You know, as a firefighter, <laughs> my first uh, rescue out of a burning fire, burning house, was a pet snake. <laughs> it was. I show up, and, and uh, it wasn't a local, it was, we were helping another department. <laughs> and the guys had been knocking down the fire, and we had fresh, you know, fresh legs, fresh blood right there, ready to go. We're in the state waiting. And uh, guys, we need to go in. We need to find. We need to find our pet. Got to go in and rescue. There's a snake somewhere upstairs. Go get it. <laughs> Amen. It was upstairs. Had to come out a, a window down a ladder. Amen. Praise God. We got it. Amen. Amen. Praise God for it. Uh, and where was I going with that? Uh, <laughs> snake. Oh yeah. Some of y'all are weird, and you like uh, you like. <laughs> pet snakes. But can you imagine having a venomous snake and it gets out of the cage and it's just living with you in the, in the house? All that potential poison just slithering around your house. And you pull back the sheets and it's like, hi. <laughs> the way this text describes it, that's how many of us are. And walking around because we have no control over this. And we're just potential poison waiting to be spewed out. Lord, help us, please. God, help us. 
that we stop being a tool of Satan and start being transformed into the image of Christ to be used for His glory. Amen. Even as Christians today, we are so guilty, so guilty of being harmful and cruel and, 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 and just nasty with our mouths. All of us are guilty of it. Every single person in, the, in this room hearing the sound of my voice, whether by way of uh, this morning here or by internet, we're all sinners and we're all guilty. So let's stop pointing a finger at everybody else and let's turn it inwards and say right here, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me. Help me, Lord. If I'm not saved, may I understand how to get saved. It's simply faith. You've got to ask and believe. In just a moment, we're going to have an invitation. I'm going to invite you to come forward. And if you are not saved, you're not, you cannot call yourself a Christian or a child of God. Or maybe you say, well, I just don't know if I died today, where I would, if I go to heaven, you need to get born again. I'm going to invite you to come forward and there'll be some assistant pastors, also some ladies with Bibles and can show you exactly what you need to do to be saved. But this, this morning, Christian, I'm going to encourage you to be back tonight. Because there'll be some practical help right here in James 3 on how we can control this here. You know, I know personally, when God starts stirring this in my heart, that I needed this. My friend acknowledged that we all need it. And let's bow before our holy God. Lord, we love you. And I thank you for what you're doing this morning. God, forgive us of our sin. Lord, we are your creation. And how many times we have spoken in ways that displease you. Lord, even in pride, turning back to our Creator, speaking with such disrespect because we were angry or because we were hurt or because of this thing or because of that thing. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Lord, help us. Lord, if there's some here today that aren't saved, may they recognize that they are black from sin and that the carnal mind in that sin, the wages of sin is death. May they recognize that. May they say, I don't want to die and go to hell. I don't want to be uh, turned away from heaven. I don't want to be uh, said, uh, depart from me. I never knew you. I don't want that. Lord, I pray they'd have the courage to come and receive you as Savior this morning. But Lord, help us as Christians to recognize what we need to do, Lord, today through tonight's message as well. May we recognize this morning that we're guilty. And we need to beg for forgiveness. Help us, please. And may you be glorified as we begin this invitation. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, the piano begins to play. I wonder this morning, with heads bowed, eyes closed, would you just with a raised hand say, God is poking me 